Bob, this was kind of your brainchild. Uh, so did you have, uh, I know one of the things that you were talking about is um, you, you had mentioned that you kind of are, are still more or less a, a, an older school sort of blocking coach. And you right. wanted to get some thoughts on, on, you know, maybe more developing a swing block and some things like that. So uh, was there a question that you kind of wanted to lead off with? Well, no, just to, to give a little background on this, you know, I'm, you know, if, and this is probably more for Mark because, you know, Jason and I know each other. Um, but, I, you know, since I left Lehigh, I, I was, I've been working with a group called Master Coaches. And we do a, a bunch of clinics around the country for, you know, for high school, college, club coaches. And, you know, for whatever reason, uh, I've been all usually delegated to the blocking, probably because other guys don't want to do it. And I said, all right, I'll, I'll do blocking. And, 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 the, and the ironic part of that is I, when I played, my worst skill was blocking. I mean, it was, it was the, I think it's the hardest skill in the game of volleyball. And so over time, especially when I got into coaching, I had to figure out, you know, I, in fact, it was back, back in the seventies, I, I was doing what is now called swing blocking because at five foot nine, there, there was no way for me to block unless, unless I, I called it an approach block. I just kind of invented it myself. I just started approaching uh, to the net to get up high enough so I could at least touch the ball. Um, but anyway, as I got into coaching, I, w I was much more focused on, you know, footwork and technique and, 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 and how to teach blocking. Uh, so anyway, I, you know, I've been doing this with, with master coaches a number of times. So when I talked with John, I said, well, I guess we, I guess we could do something on blocking because, you know, I'm, I'm always doing that. And the, and the funny part about it is it's not where I feel like I'm the strongest as a coach. And so then we got into talking about, you know, the pluses and minuses of swing blocking and, and stuff like that. So I thought this would be a good topic to, a good time to discuss that a little bit. And, and I'm excited that Mark's on. I, I know Jason is, is big on blocking. I mean, his team is a good blocking team traditionally. And I think he, he was a good blocker when he was a player. Uh, and so. Pat, Pat wouldn't that agree kinda, with that. Well, you know, I, Pat, Pav has this. Pav is the Mark is the Penn State coach. He has yeah. managed to have pretty high standards. Um, so, so you know, I, I thought this would be you know two two good guys to to have a conversation with about blocking and kind of going over, you know, the traditional blocking to you know swing blocking, the pluses and minuses, where you guys stand on it, and uh, you know where the game's going from here. Uh, well, let me, let me start, start with a question first, because you guys are going to be in different situations. Mark, I'm assuming you probably ha don't have to do a lot of technical development of blocking with the players that you normally get into your teams because they're more experienced. Is that uh, a fair statement? I, I don't, no, I don't, I don't have, I have guys who are at national team at professional level who are complete for want of a better word, that's not to mean that they're perfect. That's not to mean that's not to say that we don't do anything at all. But I I certainly don't have a fixed idea of how I or how the technique has to run and that everybody has to do it like that and and sit and spend time on it uh, to do that. So uh, with me uh, and the way that I work, it, it tends to be. Uh, more about how we block together, how we organise ourselves together. Um, we'll talk about some footwork things, uh, but we'll talk a lot more about hands and uh, positioning and timing than we do about exactly what, what we do with our feet. <coughs> I, would, I would guess it's fair to say at your level, <clears throat> it's basically all swing blocking at this stage, should I? relatively uh there are mostly we do uh but there are some differences so uh position two blockers a right side blocker uh, there are some uh some situations when the opponent's running the the 31 or the seven 
uh, that we that we don't block if we're if we're trying to block the the long quick and the ball in position the fast ball in position four then uh, the crossover is not a the swing block the crossover is not really an option and there there we might shuffle uh, there are a couple of other situations where we don't get uh, we don't get hung up on what however how we get the position um, high ball blocking I. Uh, I tend to be more a shuffle, a shuffle guy than a, a swing block guy as well. John, Paul, you on, on, uh, at your level, how many how many points are being scored with the block during a game? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't like to focus on that very much. Um, the answer is something around two, two to two and a half blocks per step. Um, I, I think about blocking as a combination of the other parts of the game. So uh, I, I don't, I almost never think about blocking just as blocking. It's part of uh, block defense counter attack. So, um, but the answer is around two to two and a half. Some really good teams might hit three. Um, the percentage of opponent attacks is about, uh, can get, get up to about 12% is a number that I look at a little bit more often. So obviously Bob and, and Jason, you guys are in a different situation and you're getting not fully formed blockers when they arrive on campus. Um, so Jason, why don't you go first in terms of your approach to, you know, especially incoming freshmen, you know, where, where are you focusing your, your teaching? Uh, I think it kind of, it, it goes a little off of what Mark was saying. I think I, I tend to look at my blocking and defense as a, as a unit together. Um, stuff blocks, are great, but I think you're, you're looking for quality touches. You're looking for your defense to set up behind the block better. So I think when I look at my team, it really kind of comes down to what their – when they arrive, I kind of look at what their skill set is. What have they done in the past? Did they come from a club that's swing blocking or did they come from a club that didn't teach swing blocking at all? Is it a high-level club, a low-level club? And to try to get a better feel for – how they're going to be when they arrive because we really only have three weeks with them before preseason begins. Um, so I have some players that are athletic and, and natural enough to jump right into swing blocking. Uh, I think the biggest issues that we have is their ability to control different parts of their body, meaning when that hip opens up, when they swing block, can they control their shoulders and still stay over the net? Can they control – different parts of their body. Uh, I think what I tend to see a lot is no. <laughs> the answer to that is no, that, that when they arrive and they start to get to college, um, they struggle a little bit with the ability to keep their eye on the ball, keep their head on the ball, line up properly with swing blocking. Um, so we'll spend a lot of time on I guess my middle is probably swing block a little more than my, my pin blockers at times. Um, we may shuffle block a little more on the pin because it's, it's a smaller area. High balls, we don't tend to swing block just because I'd rather have a good quality block set where we can defend around it. Um, and then more of when you're chasing in system, faster sets to the pin, middle blockers and pin blockers are kind of chasing and swing blocking to catch up to them. Um, so I think that's a little more of what we do, uh, but I spent a lot of time early on trying to set a plan of what we can do in a, in a three week period of time to get someone prepared to jump in and play a match. Um, and most of the time, if they're not swing blocking in three weeks, if I, if I try to force them to swing block, they're going to be bad when we get to games. So, uh, it, it's kind of a small amounts of information and, and trying to grow over a year versus complete changing of stuff. Sure. Bob, you have the advantage of, of having the fall 
available to work with the guys. So, so what's your approach with that? Well, I, I wrestle with this all the time because I'm not convinced that swing blocking is all that it's been, you know, touted to be. Uh, you know, I, I mean, my guys, their idea of a, of a, a good block is how high they jump, all right, which has nothing to do with blocking at all. I mean, it has, it has something to do with blocking, but not, it, it's not the, the most important thing. They just feel like if they've, if they've run out there and they've jumped really high, they've done everything they can to block the ball. Meantime, they're probably facing out of bounds. You know, they never get squared to the net. They're not taking a particular area away. In a lot of cases, they're not even in the right spot to, to block the ball. So what I do in the fall is kind of what I do in the, in the coaches clinics is I, I break it down to, you know, maybe three key things that they got to work at. First, I just go, I kind of go over a good ready position, a good athletic stance, you know, being square to the net and, and how you should be starting in a loaded position. Uh, a lot of them will stand there. I, I just love it. You know, they, they'll stand there with their hands down near their sides. What is that all about? I, I think it's because, you know, Mark, maybe they saw a professional guy with his hands down near his, his side. And so they've copied that, you know, I, I, I don't get that. You know, you're going to have to get your hands over the net. Why don't you get your hands up? All right. Uh, but anyway, I start with a ready position. All right. Then, then after that, I, I start working with them. All right. Making sure they're watching the spiker. You know, so many times all they do is watch the ball. All right. Or, or I don't know what they're watching sometimes. All right. But, Definitely when with the women, they have a tendency to be watching the ball all the time. I think with the guys, they watch the ball until it's time for them to run the direction that the ball is going, and then they, they, they don't watch anything. They just want to jump high, all right? Uh, so I really kind of start focusing on watching the spiker, all right? And then my the last thing I work on is just to catch the ball, all right? I had a really good assistant coach working with me the last time I was doing men, at, at Rutgers and he was, he played with the, you know, U S national team back in the late seventies, early eighties. His name's John Roberts. He was probably the best middle blocker in, in the United States at the time. Definitely in the United States, maybe, maybe one of the top in the, in the world. And he just had a knack for blocking the ball. And I just remember one day he got really frustrated with our, our guys and he goes, it's not that hard, you guys. You just need to catch the ball. Where is the spiker going to throw the ball over the net? Just go catch it. Well, of course, as the smart assistant coach, I mean, a smart head coach, I just sat and listened to what he was saying, and that became my key, you know, because it made so much sense. If, and so that's the third thing I work with, with the guys on. So I get the advantage of, of having a couple of months to work on those things, uh, but the biggest fight is getting the guys to realize that's the priorities, you know, and, and not just how high you jump. Yeah, I, I will definitely say I've, I've watched pro and, and national team caliber players swing blocking run right past the point of attack because they're, they're, they're going to block a spot instead of going to block the attacker or whatever they're supposed to be blocking. Um, of course, your teams would never do that, right, Mark? There are the 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 situation is not always as clear as as you see it. So there are uh, there are variations within it. There are tactical variations. So there are some and some coaches have it as a tactic. Some other coaches it's situational where uh, the idea is uh, the key is the timing. And the movement is at a particular time with the set, how the setter contacts the ball or whatever, and then the 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 movement and the speed and the penetration is maximum at a spot, and that spot is predetermined. And if the spiker goes somewhere else or if the set misses the, that spot, then the the hitter has a clean run. The advantage is that on the you don't have with the fast balls, a lot of opportunity to, to really see the spiker and make big adjustments. You can make some small adjustments, of course, but um, you know, the speed is such that that you have to predetermine quite a few actions. So 
Uh, some of those some of those plays where the the blocker ends up being a long way from the spiker are an accident of the game. There are obviously other ones that are just bad blocking, so you can't <laughs> you can't rule that out just because just because somebody get paid to play doesn't mean they're um, infallible. Uh, and uh, yeah, so at that speed, reading reading the spiker is not uh, an exact science. So so you can miss it. You can miss it. Uh, you can get the timing right. You can get the timing wrong if you spend too much time playing, paying attention to the spiker. And um, there are lots of there are lots of variations there. Well, essentially, what you're talking about is commit blocking. Once you once uh, you know directionality, you're essentially commit blocking to a spot. Yeah, the I, the terminology I think the the U.S. national team terminology is loading. I think. So the okay. middles middles commit, but outsides load, meaning they they they're ready to move whatever the whatever actually happens. Their 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 predetermined move is to go in in that direction. But yes, it it is a commit. It's just you know, people give stuff different names to make themselves seem more important. Jason, you're probably as aware of as anybody in terms of where th things are at with a lot of the different teaching techniques that are out there in terms of body positions, hand positions, start positions. Do you do a, a quarter turn if you're a pin, getting ready if you're in a bunch, you know, bunch read situation? Where Where's the consensus at just in terms of readiness pre-block? Uh, if, if there is one. <laughs> I don't know if there there is one. I think there's going to be a lot of people that have something specific that they that they do um, or that they teach. I've always been more of the proponent of if something works, I don't really need. I don't want to change it. I don't want to change someone to to do something that I think is proper. If I'm teaching someone who is brand new to the game, I'll probably teach someone a certain way. But when they get to when they get to me and they're a successful blocker or whatever the skill is, I want to look at what they do, how they do it, and I'll, I, I want to tweak it or make some, some adjustments to it, but I never want to change it. I never want to change someone who is successful, whether it is they open up their hips more, they stay a little more square, they start with their hands a little bit lower, they start with their hands a little bit higher. Um, I kind of look at the player of – what makes them successful and if what makes them successful is their speed and ability to get their hands from uh, a little lower position and they can explode up and, and really be fast with their hands over the net I don't need to change it if their hands are a little slower uh, and they start low then of course if they can't get their hands up fast enough then we'll talk to them a little bit about tweaking that position um, but trying to figure out what's their strengths what's their weaknesses and make their position adjust to their weaknesses versus just arbitrarily changing it to something I think is, is better. Bob, uh, any thoughts on, on any of this so far? Are we, are we, are we helping you out? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's always good to, to kind of discuss these different things. I, you know, I can't argue with what Jason's saying. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, you, if you got somebody doing something, well, why would you want to change it? Uh, and it kind of depends on whether you're starting from the, the beginning, you know, or whether you have somebody that's pretty accomplished, like, you know, Mark's going to be dealing with players that are, are pretty accomplished or they wouldn't be with him in the first place. So, you know, then it becomes more, you know, a tactical game, you know, and, and there are other things that are, are more important to be focused on uh, because they're probably just really good athletes that have found a way to, to be real successful at what they're doing. Uh, the, the really, the key things, the key things for me are really what the player is looking at. So where they're looking and when, and especially before the setter plays the ball, it's a really, uh, it's a really key point for me. And then uh, how they make decisions, how the blockers make decisions, the individual blockers um, and 
you know, particularly when they where the the options or where the situation requires them to make group decisions, how they make them at the same time. Um, and I'm not sure that that is. Uh, you guys, you guys can maybe maybe chime in. I'm not sure that that um, changes from level to level. Uh, I think those those things are key. And the, I have one question to uh, to throw to the room, and uh, something I've thought of quite a few times, and Bob's prompted it here again is is how do we how do we actually know which way of blocking is better, which footwork is better? How do we measure that one is better or worse or the same as another one? This actually goes for a few different volleyball skills, but but you know there we have people who propose one one variation of a technique, others who propose another, and have a whole list of reasons why. But how do we how do we know? How can we find out which one is actually the best? That's a good question. Uh, I guess I, for me, I mean, I always look at it as a combination. My blocking, my block, like you said before, blocking and defense. Um, and for me, it's more of what do you do? What's the team's hitting? Again, I always go off my hitting hitting percentage. The team's hitting percentage, the higher their hitting percentage, the worse my combination of defense and blocking is. Um, yeah. And so if a team is hitting a super high percentage against me, I need to go back and look, is it because they're hitting into the block and tooling the block out of bounds? Are we late? Are we in a bad position? Um, I think a lot of it comes down to, I don't know if swing blocking or uh, keeping your hips square or whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. I, to me, it's not that it's more of the, I think the most important part of blocking is what you do before the ball is set. Your, your positioning, what you see, what you read, how you react to the pass being on the net, off the net, uh, behind the setter, in front of the setter, where the hitters go, the small adjustments you make. But um, I just would always I, – I would be curious to look at what hitting percentages impact. And I know that's defense and everything else, but I, to me I think it's a combination of the two. Um, it, it, you can be a great swing blocking team and a team – can still score against you, but overall, I think if you're a very good blocking team and you're a swing blocking team or you're a uh, non-swing blocking team, I think that the the combination of the defense around your blockers, their ability to read your position, the more the non-swing blocking teams, most of the time defenders can read a little bit more of where you're going to be. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, hitting percentage is what I always look at for if my team's blocking good or not uh, against different positions, outside hitters, middles, right sides, uh, I look at hitting percentage. How can a team be a great middle, a great swing blocking team and the other team can score against them? Isn't that – does that mean that they look like they can replicate a movement really well? Are they a pretty swing blocking team? Is that what you mean? That, that's Mark has just hit the nail on the head. That's my that, that's my biggest point well, with the whole thing. You know, it just yeah. The the, the thing about the statistics um, because Igor uh, has a has a question here that I can see, but one statistic that I I actually pay a lot of attention to is um, uh, for one of the simplified version is just the number of transition attacks that I have. Um, so if I have, uh, I know roughly how many transition attacks that I, I should be having. And the, if that's high or low, that's a pretty good, um, uh, it's a pretty good measure of, or at least an indication of how good my blocking is. The better my blocking is, the more, the more transition attacks that I will have. And then the trend, the, uh, attack percentage in transition is also a good measure of your uh, good indication of your blocking because the better you block, the better digs you have, or you get touches that you can give, you know, play to the uh, play to the net and play uh, fast in transition. So 
those are, are really good for me, really valuable indications of uh, how my blocking's working. Uh, opponent attack percentage is one. Um, and Igor's question is about the statistic for the best middle blocker. Um, I, I look at uh, opponent attack percentage against that middle and break point percentage as well. So how, um, how I score or break points when one particular middle is in the front row. Just, just for the Americans out there, <laughs> break point is when you're serving. Right. <laughs> Old point, real point. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, what about, actually, I mean, we could throw that, that same question um, out to you guys. How do you statistically try to measure the effectiveness of your middle blockers? Jason and Bob. Good, Bob. Well, that's, that's why I was asking Mark. Well, one of the reasons why I was asking Mark about, uh, you know, how many points were being scored uh, by his block, all right, uh, you know, I, I think that's a, an indication if if they're being really effective blocking. Uh, you know, and and it was interesting that probably he's his percentage of two point five per game is very similar to the women's game at the college level in the United States. You know, the men's game at the college level in the United States it's a little bit closer to three, but it's not a lot of points. All right, it really becomes more of of how your defense is working and and both Jason and Mark have addressed that. You know, the, the block has either, you know, got to be effective blocking the ball or they got to be able to help your backcourt defense be able to play the ball up so you can transition out and, and, and win on your counterattack. So measuring, you know, how many balls you're transitioning, you know, at, you know, is, is pretty key. Uh, as same as, you know, what is the opponent's hitting percentage? You know, the, the reason Mark's blocking is probably – you know, at 2.5, the same as the college game, it's because they're, the hitters he's playing against are that much better, all right? Uh, and, my team's blocking was closer, the last season was closer to 1.8, I said that. So, <laughs> I said that, was a, that was a typical number. But I, I think it's it's the whole thing that, that, that that's really key. Yeah. So the middle blocker, you know, I, I like to see my middle blocker uh, actually closer to three, all right? You know when he's when he's playing in a match because he's got assist blocks, he's got more opportunities to to block a ball. You can add, Jason. Yeah, I think that uh, yeah. I mean, in the women's game, we're the the best teams are three point one somewhere in there, and and then the, the your two point five is is great. I I always tell my my middles. I don't really care, but I don't care if we average zero blocks a game. It's about touches. It's about how many balls you you can touch and slow down to give us a better transition opportunity. So I we we spend a lot of time with with hand positioning and making sure that it's not always about the stuff block. It's about not getting tooled. It's about slowing that ball down to give us a better opportunity. Um, so we we my better blocking teams. We might average. We probably had years where you you average lower but you hold teams to a lower hitting percentage because you have really good blockers that can slow the ball down and now you transition at a higher rate. So uh, if I had to pick between the two, I would rather average 1.8 blocks a game, but get five or six more quality touches per game to give myself opportunities to transition than average one more stuff block a game but get tooled because we're out of control and we can't uh, – we're not putting ourselves in good defensive positions and all of our transition swings are from bump sets from 25 feet off the net because we're not defending well. So um, I, I like looking at the – like Mark said, the transition and the number of touches that we can get where we can get a uh, – if you talk about passing rating, a two pass, if we can get a two, we can set the middle and we have more than one option. Um, that's more of what I look for out of my, out of my middles is slowing people down uh, so that we can transition attack. Uh, so looking for our, our hitting percentage in transition and correlate that with the number of touches that we're getting at the net. 
Um, we had a question that came in on, on the chat. It was somebody was wondering for I, they say swing blocking, but I would imagine this question has to apply regardless. Would you rather have your blockers early or late in terms of when the hitter swings? And you know, is that in, is something that you want to be judging in terms of whether block is good or bad? Now, from my perspective, a lot of times when I've when I've looked at bad blocks, it's usually because they're dreadfully late blocks, uh, at least in the women's game. Um, I, you know, I won't speak to the men's side of things. So, uh, I don't know. My argument might be early is better than late, but I'd love to hear what you guys think. I'd rather have them on time. <laughs> <laughs> Optimal solution, yes. Yeah. For me, the... The timing of the block is is uh, is maybe the most important part of, of all of it. So more than footwork, um, position is position is obviously important. Um, maybe they're fifty fifty, but but timing is really super important. I, I this it's the, something that I think a lot about. For high balls, it's better to be. Uh, it's definitely, in my opinion, it's definitely better to be late. Uh, the high ball block, the later you block, the better. Um, it's really difficult. Spiking a high ball is really difficult. And it's because the, the spiker is looking up on a high ball, it's really difficult for them to see the block um, at the same time. And the longer that you can wait or the longer the delay between the the spiker jumping and seeing the block, the much better, um, and that actually makes much more sense if you can see my whole body, sorry about that. Um, the, it's, it's, the spiker doesn't know where the court is until he sees the block really often. So you don't want him to see the block. So later is better. With, with men's volleyball, um, if the block is early, it often gives the spiker a, a better orientation to the court and it, it opens up the options to tool, um, to delay the attack so that they can hit off an arm or an elbow. So um, I, tend to, I tend to go with it's better to be too late um, on anything, on any ball where you have some time, which is a high ball and a medium ball. Fastballs, that, that starts to be a little bit different, different because you're chasing after the ball and you're nearly never, uh, you're nearly never on time. So you're nearly always, you're nearly always late, and then there you want to be earlier. So, but I, I think that there are things with the timing that we can play with more to get more advantage out of blocking. But I'm not sure what they are. I was hoping for some input from you guys. Well, one advantage of, of, of being late is, is you can defensive block a ball uh, and not necessarily attack block and, and, and get a quality touch and still be able to get a transition play out of that. Um, yep. And I think that the, to me, I think the, the, the later, if you're, if you're late, you tend to be a little stronger in that position than you are when you jump early and you're on your way down. You tend to get a little weaker with your hand positioning and your your strength. So there's the opportunity to get tooled or something go wrong. Uh, so I, again, I agree. I think that if I had to choose one, I would I would prefer to be late because I think that that leads to a little bit more uh, strength in your in your block and you think you can get a better quality touch that way along with the blockers, not the hitter, not being able to see where you you are as a blocker. Uh, I think that's always a an added plus to it. All right, let's let's talk a little bit of tactics because we had a, a question come in uh, on the on the subject of blocking zonally versus blocking the ball. So, in what situations are you guys having your block take the hitter, take the ball, versus try to take an area of the court? Jason, why don't you start? Okay. Um, we, we, I mean, I guess I got three, three ways of doing it. We do, uh, you call it fronting or, or whatever, take, 
you can, the easiest way you say is just take the charge. If, you, if your kids are basketball kids, front the hitter, and they approach angle that they're taking so that if they keep going, they're, they're going to run right into you. Um, and then uh, line up with left hand on the ball or right hand on the ball uh, based off of what you're, what you're taking away. I think that most of the time people hit the, the lower the level. Uh, most times people hit in the direction they go. Um, and so you, you front – or you line up in front, uh, front a hitter and force them to take the ball down line or do something additional to, to hit past the blocker. Um, we'll strategically change things based off of where our good defenders are. Um, if I've got a bad setter defensively and my libero is really good, not even looking at the, the hitter itself, just say I'd rather have that ball be hit at my libero uh, and not at my setter at all. We'll just say, let's just take line, allow them to hit cross court um, and uh, make some adjustments at that point. So I think that for me, it's all about adjustments during the game. You come up with an initial strategy of taking line, taking cross court. Uh, but I do the same thing with the middles. The middles, what's their line of approach? If they're coming from the, the two zone across, then we're going to take the, the cross court. If they're coming, force them to do something the opposite direction than what they're used to. But then a lot of times we'll adjust that in the game or we'll go based off of, I don't want my setter to have to, to dig the ball as much. Uh, or if it's uh, in the men's game, you don't want, if, you're, if your right side's not as good as defender, you might take something away to force the ball at your libero uh, and put more pressure on them to dig more. So that would be my, my, my sense of it. Oh, what about you? Well, I think it's pretty much what Jason was just saying. I mean, I basically look at, you know, the tendencies of the opponent attacker and that could determine whether we're going to area block or we're going to, you know, block the ball. I also look at what our personnel is like. You know, we had an outstanding libero, you know, this year, all right? And, I mean, he could dig just about anything, came anywhere and hit his half of the court. So we'd have a tendency to try to channel balls to him, all right? And, and he'd, he'd pretty much be able to handle most, most of the balls being hit in, into his area, and we'd get a chance to transition out. I think so those are two areas, you, you know, you, you kind of look at. But, you know, the, the, the funny thing is, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll go into the game, and Jason mentioned this, you'll go into the game with how a, a, an opponent, you know, played against another team. And it's completely different when they play against your team. You know, all, <laughs> all of a sudden they, they were hitting everything cross court. Now all of a sudden against your team, they can drill the ball down the line. So you, you have to be prepared to, to change a, as the game uh, progresses. Uh, in the perfect world, uh, especially when you have a little bit of time, the the line or cross choice that you make based on scouting is based on where the ball is. So the the line or cross is not a is not in relation to the antenna. It's it's actually in relation to the spiker and where the set goes and where the set leads the spiker. So um, you know you you're nearly in the perfect world, you're nearly always starting with a ball in the ball, let's say. we I talk about the approach a lot. Um, and then the, the line or cross works, uh, moves from that position. Uh, I would say that as time goes on, I tend to actually block less areas um, because the, um, I, I like to to, uh, to block the middle of the court and to make the make spikers hit towards the edges of the court. So um, I, I tend not, I more and more tend not to go extremes of line or cross in, in most normal situations. Uh, triple blocking. Like. Obviously in the men's game, uh, in the men's game, you're going to, you're, you're always shooting to have a triple on any sort of eyeball. Um, the strategy depending trying to get three three sets of hands up on a middle attack uh, Jason in the in the women's game what do you 
trying to do with the triple? Uh, we we haven't done it that much. Um, I think that the the times that we've had, I, we've played some teams that have done a lot of triple blocks, um, and I think they've been successful with it. I think that the the issues that we have at times, most of the time, I'm just trying to I'm trying to get a double block up uh, <laughs> and make sure I got two blockers on everyone. Um, but we've we've struggled the most during different times of uh, doing a triple block and then the hitters actually being able to transition out of it and us we might get a good touch but then the outside hitter can't get around and then we don't get a good swing out of it. So I weigh, I go back and forth and weigh the is it is the attacker that we're playing against good enough that they're going on a high ball out of out of system where we would triple. Um, can we get a good enough block and defend and the number of times that they're going to get a kill versus we're going to get a better defensive play, therefore getting a better transition play um, out of it. And, and I've seen with my team, we get better transition plays out of it when I don't triple block than when I have triple blocked um, because I don't have the, the back row attack um, prowess that in the men's game that, that, that they have, where they, they set a lot of pipes and bicks and use the back row game more. So I'm more, a little more reliant on my front row attackers to be able to block and then transition and swing. So um, we've stayed away from it a little bit for those reasons. I think we've gotten better transition attacks more often by not triple blocking. Bob, you're kind of in a middle situation with a with, with the the college guys. What's what's your approach? Well, I, my, my approach is kind of the middle <laughs> middle position. Uh, you know, I, I don't have my team exclusively triple blocking. Uh, I I don't spend a lot of time coaching them to, to do that. Uh, but I'm very complimentary of the guys that take the initiative to do that. So I have a couple of guys on the team that really you know. If we're inside blocking a little bit and and the, the play is a little out of system and they can kind of read where it's going, you know, then they, they, they go ahead and they put that, that triple block up. And, and we do have a, a backcourt attack, so we have that that option to, to go to the backcourt if we transition out. So so I can encourage it uh, whenever they can do it. And I kind of, you know, reinforce them doing it. But I don't spend a lot of time training it. Uh, because we just have so many other things that we have problems with. Uh, so it's usually more individual than it is a, a team function for us. Mark, why don't you talk about the decision making on, on the bunch read and when you, get, when you want guys to be committing to help out in the middle versus basically committing to, to go to the pins. My, I tend to, um, I, I tend to be a, a read, a base read guy. Um, so uh, I don't, um, I don't have a lot of committing in uh, the game plan. For example, uh, what I like my guys to do is to uh, commit in situations. So it's a, a, a read commit, a commit read where. Uh, they understand some situations when the setter might be moving in a particular way uh, that they can make decisions to commit in the in the moment. Um, I my my general philosophy is that the position four guy should be able to help nearly all the time. Um, so we the that's based on the on the uh, reading of the setter and because the hand position of a front set and a front set and a back set is is actually quite quite pronounced um, then the, there should be um, the opportunity for the position four guy to, to block both balls um, maybe not to get to the line on the um, the ball in position two or one but uh, definitely to be involved with both of those plays. So uh, position two is different. 
position to is is normally uh, on their own to a degree, uh, but but that's the, the the fundamental part or the basic part of what I'm trying to do. Jason, anything different with you in terms of a bunch in your block? Uh, I don't disagree. I think that they, it, it's much easier for that the position four uh, to help out. I think the the biggest difference in the in the women's game is you'll have a lot of right sides that run slides. Um, so if a right side runs a slide, the the tempos they're not going to help out on a quick and stay with the slide. Uh, we'll commit that attacker on the slide and basically be on a perfect pass. You're going to be one on one, probably on the slide. You'll be one on one on the quick. And then we'll try to get two on the outside. So we'll we'll pinch block and bunch block. Um, and if it's high balls to the pin, I think that we'll try to get two up on the 31 uh, and two up on the quick. If it's and then obviously we 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 we'll do some commit blocking if the setter's front row and the middle stays in. That position four is going to commit. Uh, if we if we're not doing anything with the setter, uh, they'll commit. Um, on that quick attack and free up the, the middle a little bit to help out or release. Uh, but on three attackers, we li I like to pinch um, as much as I can to get a double block up on everything if we have the ability to. Bob, how are we doing on these topics so far? Good. I think, you know, the only thing I would add to, to that, I mean, what, what, what the guys have just said are, are pretty accurate for us too. The only thing I would add is, is, you know, especially if if we have people that are, you know, working with a lower level uh, teams, is to to look at what the opponent is doing. I mean, I, when I first came to Sacred Heart, I was kind of shocked that they were bunch blocking on everything. You know, and and I said, all right, well, let me let me, you know, I'm gonna, I'm going to spend a little time watch what's going on. And they were great at bunch blocking and, and flying outside. I mean, sometimes they would go right past the antenna, but they they looked good when they were doing it. All right, and I'm watching. I'm watching the teams we're playing, and everybody's going quick to the antenna. All right, hardly anybody's going out, you know, doing bix or, or, or running a pipe. And I'm, I'm saying, why are we blocking inside? I mean, everybody's beating us on the outside. This was kind of in the preseason, so I think you have to look at the opponent, what the opponent's doing, and then kind of, you know, determine what's going to be a, your blocking, you know, alignment. All right, and, and strategy from there. Well, on, on that sort of topic, Mark is a bit of a scouting fiend. Uh, he even has applications to help him do it. So one of the questions that Rodrigo posted earlier was, are you doing your blocking strategy based on a rotation or based on the attacker or attackers? Uh, mostly attacker. Okay. Is that different for either of you guys? No. I don't think we're quite that sophisticated, but yeah, I mean, we'll look at tendencies of the attacker. All right. Uh, I, I was speaking about just the, the tendency overall of the, of the opponent, uh, you know, sure. and so after you get past that, then you can start to, to drill down into more specifics like Mark's doing with the, the actual attackers. Okay. Uh, by that, I mean, by that, I mean, I, I look at, I, the scouting is, the scouting that I do is focused on the uh, on the spike, is not by rotation. So I I don't have a, a different tactics for six six rotations. It'll be uh, player X block cross, player Y block line, um, middles read, and you know, some some version of that. So it's actually much less sophisticated than John uh, John implied. <laughs> Yeah, no, we do. We do. We do it by player. Also, I don't. We don't tend to do too much rotation because I've. I've always. My players, when they when they look at rotations, they kind of always go off of. Well, we we start in this row, so these would be my rows. So they tend to pay more attention, and then they don't remember when the team flips and goes to a different rotation, what we talked about. So they they tend to remember a little bit more of, of that hitter number five. We're blocking line on number five. We're doing this. Um, they tend to remember a little bit more specific player information than they do rotation information. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I love when the opponent rotates and it confuses your team or better yet is when you rotate 
to, to try to get a matchup and, and, and they completely get lost. Like they, you know, it's amazing to me that they, that makes a difference. To them. All right. <laughs> um, okay. We, we, we talked about, you know, the, the linkage between blocking and defense and how you think you, you, you want to think of them as, as a unit, especially with, with regards to turning into uh, attacking opportunities and transition. So who's, who's making the judgments in terms of what the strategy is? Is it a case of the blocker saying, we're going to do this, and then the defenders just, okay, we're going we're gonna to do this behind them? Is it a unified system that everybody is, is on the same read and thus making the same play? How are you guys training that? Who wants to jump first? I'll jump first. I mean, right. we're, we're, we're basically doing it as, as a team and, and, you know, you know, Hey, our blocks going to take, you know, something away and the, the defense is going to play around the block. I mean, I'm making it as, as simple as possible and, and just trying to teach them that concept, uh, you know, sometimes is, is difficult enough. We, we tend to, to start with, as a team, this is our plan. Um, but I, I like to give at least my, my middle blockers a little more freedom to make a change on the fly if they've gotten beat or they want to do something different and, and may do a hand signal to communicate to the defense that they're going to do something a little different here. They're going to jump into a different angle. They're going to take a different zone away um, against this middle this time because they got beat if they remember information and they got beat and they want to they wanted do something, I like to give my middles a little bit more freedom there. We don't do the same with the, the pin blockers. The pin blockers kind of stick within the, the team concept, but the middles we give a little bit more freedom to make some kind of adjustment and, and correlate that with the defense. I, I don't like – I don't like the defenders to chase spaces in the block. Uh, I, th I think there are too many moving parts, uh, too many issues of timing um, to to be able to do with to be able to chase holes with any sort of certainty. So I like the defenders to be. I don't want to stay. I don't want to say static exactly because it, that's not exactly right, but something like static um, and I have a basic principle that uh, everything that's touched by the block I want to defend so um, it's not important for me for the for defenders to, to chase spaces but it is important for, me, for them to chase the ball after it hits the block and I've done work, uh, actually done work with the defenders, especially position six, uh, reading reading a lot more and not having fixed positions even on, even on high balls. Um, and that, that tends to be pretty successful, especially because the position six guys are uh, behind a block. When the, when the ball's medium, they're, they're behind a block and they actually have a really good option and really good opportunity to chase after the ball rather than chase into spaces. That, that actually brings up something that I was just thinking about in terms of your position six player and, and how in and, and the men's game much more so than the women's game, although it's still not a huge number. You sometimes will say the six player drop behind the end line in anticipation of the ball off the block, high end shot. So, to the extent that you're actually coaching them in that regard, what sort of thing are you having them look at to make that assessment? I don't, I, I don't like them to be behind the line. On the line is, is perfectly fine, but because they are not expecting to have any ball that's spiked directly at them, they should be, uh, they should be standing quite high because they, if, the rest of the team functions well, i.e. the block, then nothing will will should hit them unless something goes over the block, um, which can happen, but uh, it's not a it's not a, a big part of it. So they need they should be upright or relatively upright 
uh, and the things that they're watching are the things that blockers watch. So, the first thing is the the origin of the set. So, when the, the ball is on the baseline, it's probably going to be a high ball. It's seventy percent of the time it's going to be off the net. Um, the blockers should be actually should be looking at the same thing and. If the set is on the baseline, for example, then they can be ready not to block. Um, so all of the players are looking at the same things and being ready to make the same decisions. Uh, so where the set comes from, where the set goes, what the direction of the spiker's approach is, um, where he hits it behind his head, in front of him, um, where the where the block is, uh, and then then you can be in a position as the spiker contacts the ball and then you can be ready to run after it hits the block. Uh, Jason, you have any different sort of philosophy with position six? Yeah, I mean, we don't, uh, we're never having our kid, our, our, our players, they're usually up a little bit more from the end line. Um, we tend to have a little more, not as high level blockers. So there's a lot more seam, even when it's, uh, they're together. Um, so I think that, uh, we, we tend to line up in, in the seam of the block, um, and then look to run stuff down. Also, I don't think that it's, it's a whole lot different. Um, as we go no, normally, uh, that normally the, the bad part of blocking is normally, in my opinion, the, the outside blockers tend to reach a little towards the antenna, which is what we try to focus on not doing, never reaching out, reaching back in. Um, and that's usually what creates that seam and being able to defend the seam. If it's an out of system and we're, we're together blocking and just going straight up, we're probably going to push our middle back either deeper looking for the ball off the block or uh, strategy wise rotating a little bit more towards that corner. Uh, with the libero coming across, uh, going a little tighter to the 10-foot line. Um, and that will be more strategy based off of that attacker of where we're going to go on a, a high ball out of system based off of where they've gone. But um, I think most of the time you're lining up, in the, in, for me, we're lining up in that seam of the block because uh, balls tend to make their way through that seam more often than, uh, than, than I would like them to. What about you, Bob? Well, oh, pretty much the same as, as uh, both Mark and Jason went over. The only difference is, um, you know, when, when Mark was saying he doesn't have the, the six-player fill the fill the hole at all, I, I'll have that, that player fill the hole. That's the only player I want. Unfortunately, the, the challenge is, and I think this is where Mark's coming from, if the players don't play around the block and play their position, almost a static position, especially in the men's game, there's not a whole lot of time to react to the ball. You don't run balls down in the men's game. You're either there or you're not there. All right. But unless, of course, the block touches the ball. All right. But because of what Jason was saying, you know, I'll have a tendency to let that number six, if the, the blockers don't close, take a step up and, and, and to fill that seam a little bit. The problem is making sure the other players don't try to do that. Invariably, the, the wing players all want to do that. And you and, and you got to be pretty disciplined about that. So I can understand where he's saying, hey, I don't let anybody do that. They just play their position. Uh, it's you know because otherwise everybody's cutting in there and filling holes and nobody's playing the defense. The yeah, what I said the 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 phrase that I use is I don't like people chasing the seams. Yes. Yeah. So and that's exactly what it is, what you described, where everybody says, "Well, I can see the ball, so why shouldn't I be standing here?" Um, position six on faster balls, where there's an expectation that the block might not be closed, then uh, then they have freedom as as you do uh, to to be in some space in the block. But it has, but for me, it has to be in a certain range. So, yeah, so we're talking um, about the same thing then, yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. All right, we just we just hit, or slight, went slightly past an hour. So if you have questions, this is your time to get them in. Uh, I want to bring up the idea of this, and it's kind of tied in with a question that came in by email, is when 
are you blocking to get a point versus blocking to try to get a touch or theoretically to take away space as, as your primary philosophy? Jason, why don't you go? Uh, I mean, I think that I always want my blockers to have the mindset that they're they're blocking to get a point. Uh, I keep thinking that keeps them aggressive. I think that keeps them uh, in an attack mindset of that way. I don't want them just to kind of, if I, if I feel like if I tell them, hey, you're just blocking to take up space, then they're not going to reach over as much. They're not going to be as aggressive. So I think I want my blockers to have that mindset that they're always blocking to, to score a point. Um, but within that, I think the point can be a stuff block. It can be a touch that we transition. I think it could be uh, a funneling the ball down line um, and uh, allowing us to defend. I think that you can kind of have the mindset of always b blocking to, to score a point uh, without them – having to to reach into reach extreme angles and and reach into uh, I never really want my my blockers to reach into a position where defenders are going to be so if I know we're supposed to give line or we're giving line but the blocker thinks they're uh can can read the line I'd rather have them allow that ball to be hit down line and us defend it than them reach out and try to get a stuff block. So I think to me, it's a combina It's a combination of, of all those factors, but I always want my blockers to think about what they're doing is blocking to score a point, but we can score a point in four different ways versus just the stuff block. Mark, you look very serious and engaged <laughs> in something. I don't know what. <laughs> no, uh, for me, that's, that, part's, that part's all the same. Right. The reason I brought the reason I brought this up is because I was at a uh, a session at the the AVCA this past year, where uh, Davide, the Italian women's national team coach, I'm forgetting his last name, maybe you think of it, Mark, but he was I actually he was talking about blocking strategy on different sets, and I asked him the question, you know, when uh, when is your block trying to take space versus trying to actually put hands on the ball, and his his approach was or at least the way he described it for that team was if the blocker was one-on-one -on -one, he wanted them to try to put hands on the ball if it was a double or a triple block then he wanted them taking space so you know in the light of that does that change um responses at all i i always want the the first object to be to block the ball so Blocking to me is a is a really aggressive. It's an aggressive action. It requires an aggressive mindset. Um, the one maybe small area where where I can change that idea is uh, on triple blocks, and on triple blocks the um, I want players to be aggressive, but I don't want people to be individually trying to block the ball. So. Um, when when everybody's trying to block the ball, they all end up reaching into the same space and and crossing over each other and making seams. So um, that in a triple block, I want them to block aggressively, but only in front of them. Uh, on the other times, uh, I want them always to have the idea that this ball is going to get a block. And I don't disagree with the the one on one. I think if 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 my if my if my blockers are one on one, uh, I want them to go get the ball. Um, and because again, I I think it's not much of a difference if my outside blockers are reaching back in. I still think my middle my middle back and my left back can defend around that one blocker. So I'd rather have them one on one, put hands on the ball, uh, but. My original statement was more, if I have a double block, I don't want them all converging on the ball and having four hands into a small small area. So I'd rather have them take space, be aggressive, um, and score and look to score. But 
Uh, one on one, I think we're we're a little more aggressive in trying to put your hands on the ball. Anything from you, Bob? No, I think we'll just be splitting hairs right now. Uh, I think we're basically <laughs> all saying the same thing. Um, all right. Well, that's this brings up something that that Rodrigo asked is the situationally when do you want the block jumping for maximum height versus maximum penetration and it tries which to might be which might be a lower block you know what i mean hands further across the net penetration always. always penetration i don't disagree with this but i see a lot of men's teams where the ball where the hands seem to be straight up in the air not just men's teams let's face it we have a lot of teams that don't really get much penetration but it does look like they're intentionally just trying to get as high as they possibly can. I think we addressed that right in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Definitely. The, the, the whole key is getting over the net. That's, that's the most important part. Yeah. I, I think all of us would, would live and die if yeah. we had to lose a match because it, someone could hit over top of our block in the court and score 20 points. We'll probably just go. Wow, that was that was pretty good. I, I think we'd I'd rather that because they're going to hit balls out of bounds. They're going to make errors if they constantly try to go over top. Um, so I'd rather be hit over top of than than be able to hit underneath and score. I think that's a higher percentage than over top. Sure. Agreed. All right, we had a question come in. Let's say I coach a high school team and I have a six foot middle blocker who touches the ball a lot and five foot eight and under pins who rarely, if ever touch the ball, what would you do with that blocking scheme? And defense, cause we got to take the defense into consideration here. Well, that, that's a real good question because that's what I think most coaches are faced with that kind of a situation. I, to be honest, I, I I would still have my five foot eight person block because they're going to set a block that's going to allow my defenders to, to read, and then I would move my middle back and dig over, have my middle back dig over top of, again depending on the attacker, but I would work on having my middle back defend, a little bit over top and putting two defenders because most most attackers if they're smart are going to attack the smaller blocker, so I would still keep my setter or right back digging down line i'd move my middle back a little bit over into that seam over top and then have my libero be more responsible for that that area but i still would have that five eight person block so that they could set a block which would make my defenders be able to read a little bit more versus i see a lot of teams that pull that blocker off and have that middle just and they end up flying all over the place and they can't it's hard to defend around that because no one really knows where that person is going to end up so I'd keep the five eight person up there and have them block um, to set a block a little more. Yeah, the th the thing that I would put in in that sort of scenario is most of the time the attackers are not as good as you think they are. You might say, yeah, they're going to hit over the top of that block all the time, but chances are they probably aren't. And if they're that good, then that might give you other problems to begin with. So the one scenario that can really create a problem with that is if you have a really super smart attacker who just uses that end block and just wipes the ball off them all the time. It doesn't even try to go over the top. Then that becomes a serious challenge. Yep. All right. <laughs> no arguments there. Uh, okay. Uh, just in case, uh, one last call for questions if anybody's got any. Uh, Bob, this was this was your topic. So, have we touched? Have we not touched on something that you want to touch on? Anything? No, I think we're good. I think we covered a lot, of, a lot of good points on blocking. Uh, I think we 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 might not have addressed uh, completely, you know, swing blocking, com, you know, compared to traditional blocking. But if you were listening, you know, between between everything that was being said. I think it's when it's appropriate, you do it. You don't just do it because somebody said, oh, we, you got to swing block all the time. That, that doesn't make any sense to me. 